Thank you, dear speakers and panelists, that you joined us again here on stage for a final discussion round. I would like to begin with something I heard today from the news. The federal government is today discussing in the cabinet an intermediate report on hydrogen, and it was communicated that they draw a very positive intermediate balance. So, thumbs up what is being done for hydrogen in Germany so far. But I would like to ask this question the panelists. How do you assess this? Is the intermediate balance of the federal government for support for hydrogen, is it as positive as the federal government believes? I begin here and please everyone say one or two sentences. Mr. Bratke, it's a difficult question. I think mainly the major issue is that without renewable energies we cannot get green hydrogen, so we must import green hydrogen, so all this must be connected. So if the federal government supports this, but in 25 years we want to be carbon neutral and some um, motorway takes longer and uh, time is running out unless we speed up massively. Mrs. Zurich, speeding up massively also for utilities? Yes, speeding up, yes, definitely. And on your question, the federal government, in fact, over the last nine months, um, speed it up, be it the um, revision of the Renewable Energies Act and the levy, so if green electricity is used, but speeding up also means that a holistic view must be taken. And this leaves several questions open, for example, transport. And if this is how this can work and do, can a regulated or an unregulated market ensure this? So the question is, how can all these elements be brought together? Mr. Lanzar, what Uniper, federal government, thump up or down? Well, th I would say thump up. A lot has been done, a lot has been initiated, and as Dr. Zoya just said, I would share this view. And uh, I endorse this. Hydrogen, on the one hand, we need the green electrons, we need the infrastructures, and we need the regulatory framework. And I must bring this together. So m more must happen, but in this area, quite a lot has already happened over the last two months. Mr. Berkler, this morning I mentioned that the Metal Union demands that the federal government speed up more and give more support, especially for the steelmaking industry. I cannot speak for the German government, but I would say the German government um, is uh, making it difficult for Austria to follow up, and uh, we will have to follow up. This is a positive statement. Mr. von Weizsäcker, from a more global perspective, how far has Germany come when it comes to hydrogen? I also see it as a positive development. It's the first legislative period where this topic is taken seriously. Clear statement, Mr. Stamatelopoulos. You have, you're wearing two hats, the ENBW hat and the VGBE hat. So how do you assess the federal government? I think in this question, I can combine both roles well, but these questions shortly before the general elections is a little bit conspicuous, but I, nevertheless I would like to answer this. I would also like to say thumbs up for hydrogen and say the support conditions and the relevance of the topic have been understood in this legislative period. So the intermediate balance can be positive. But nevertheless, what we also heard from the other colleagues, it is important and a precondition for the development of the hydrogen infrastructure. We need a massive development of renewables. And this did not work well during the last legislative period. This must also be said openly and in a transparent manner. And we as VGB, we focus more on the technical side. We are not politicians. In this sense, the conclusion is mixed when it comes to the development of renewables as a precondition for the development of hydrogen economy. And second, we tend, and politicians tend, to describe the final goal, the ultimate goal is always very positive, but there are also intermediate steps which are sometimes difficult. And truths must also be said in terms of disposable uh, power. This 
was also mentioned very clearly. And in this respect, we need PR work and outreach work that must be very intensive to make the population understand this. Thank you for this first round. I would like to connect to what you just said, Mr. Standard Bildopoulos, potential for the development of renewables, as we already heard it in several presentations. 80% of the hydrogen must be imported, as we heard. Mr. Bratke, first, the perspective of science and of Fraunhofer Institute, how do you see the development potential for renewables in Germany that we need for green hydrogen? Where do you see the last development stage? What is still possible? I showed it in my slides. We expect that for reasons of acceptance we have to increase it four times. But this is a very brave forecast. We must take the citizens on board. We must involve them early. We must explain the advantages. We must show that there are clear framework conditions, that administration is safe and that it is not rendered ineffective through litigation. And there are many examples of how climate protection and renewable energy can be brought together major potential still exist in terms of photovoltaics. We have so many roofs, we have areas on carports, mm -hmm. and there are considerations between the rails and on the sleepers to attach photovoltaic cells. So without attacking nature, there is a lot of potential to develop renewables, and we have to do this massively. So the boundary or the cap is the acceptance by the population, acceptance by the citizens on um, foreign countries. Mr. von Weizsäcker, you mentioned that it must be seen globally. Climate protection is a global task, not just for hydrogen, but decarbonization must also be global. You presented a model. How do you see the fairness and equitability aspect and how should countries cooperate globally in order to s provide each other with green electricity and hydrogen. What is necessary for that? The North, in the 19th century, kept the developing countries small. This was totally unfair. That was colonialism. Colonialism is a big sin in Africa and understood as such, and we have to catch up from the north. And the budget approach is the first serious attempt to bring in certain degree of fairness, because we exhausted the resources at the beginning, and now we have to give things away, and otherwise, the atmospheric and the global situation means that hydrogen, that the subtropic belt is ideal for hydrogen, and therefore it's also physically, uh, it makes sense physically to install the main capacities over there. Mr. Landsmann, Mrs. Suri, and Mr. Stamatolopoulos, from a company and utility perspective, what is your position at your companies in um, projects abroad and in cooperation? You said it. We have a similar situation. We have core markets in Europe in the Benelux, in the UK, in Sweden, where we actively push projects. And Uniper, we are active in 14 countries. And the liquid gas area, and gas is also green gas at the end, of, or can be green gas. Every second day, we ship liquid gas. We just initiated three projects in the Middle East where we produce green electrons, or where we will produce green electro electrons um, to convert it to hydrogen, and this will then be shipped to Europe. So we are active at a global scale with liquid gas and liquid hydrogen of the future, and we will be active there as Uniper. So building on this for RWE as a leading trader, the question of imports is also important. If we ask from which regions will this hydrogen come, we have a portfolio, we have a cooperation with H2U from Australia, we are investigating 
to what extent hydrogen can be transported. This is a very important point. We are talking about transport and massive transport costs and the question which form and which carrier will be the ideal one. So the final solution is still open, but certainly not from southern Europe. It makes sense. We have a certain division of labor in Europe and very low um, production cost at the renewables end and we can also supplement each other. So we can ship it by vessels and tankers and pipelines, so a portfolio of accessibility will be established. And at the end of the day, also from our perspective, we must explore the options. There is no right or wrong, but ultimately the time will have to show what will materialize in the end. Mr. Stamatilopoulos. From your and VGB perspective, you're an international association. What about cooperations at present? Let me please um, let me please begin not with NBW. We have strong roots in Germany and in the southwest of Germany. And the reason why we went abroad over the past years is simply due to the fact that our goals, that we want to achieve our goals, and these are the renewable goals. And if we would do so only in Germany, it would not be possible. And therefore, we decided to go towards the UK for offshore. We were successful in an auction together with our partner for three gigawatts offshore. And now we also have an, we uh, took part in an auction in Scotland. The result is still open in France. We all already established a um, PV uh, position, but it's important for me. And also in Sweden and other countries, and also for the US, we are interested, and for Taiwan, for offshore projects. But it's important also in the context of our conference here is to explain why we did say this, because we saw borders and uh, boundaries in Germany which we could not overcome. And this is a positive issue. When it comes to the VGB, with its history, it has a very good reputation abroad, specifically in conventional and nuclear generation. And over the past years, and as my predecessor also launched in this function, and I am determined to continue this with commitment. We also try to venture in uh, renewables. We want to grow in the renewables area abroad, especially with the contacts we have in India and Japan. And al we also have delegates from Japan here where we try to be focused when it comes to pushing renewables. Thank you, Mr. Burgler. We are currently talking about green hydrogen and green power that needs to be imported from abroad. And we've heard that this is going to be a scarce resource. You, who is going to buy this power uh, and hydrogen? And is there going to be a fight over distributing this? Uh, that the you are in competition with other company who companies who is going to be able to bind them? We didn't talk at all about the chemical industry. So for uh, soil and uh, for making it uh, better. So this is a huge, huge field. So the dimensions are even bigger. I think that 150 years the fossil energy and production system has been used and it is a very perfect system by now. But now we are pressed for time. In a very short time we have to redesign the entire system and this can only be done using vast capital and it needs a mixed approach. 1961, John F. Kennedy said, in nine years I would like to be on the moon. And Yuri Gagarin was uh, in space. And something is needed like that. We need a power grid and PV nets and grids are also protecting our environment. So therefore, so we need to protect the plants and we also need to understand that the power grid and the lines through which we deliver power can also be understood as something that 
protects nature and the very plant. So therefore, we need all the other industries here. Uh, and there's a mixed approach, I believe, that is going to be ever more important. Mr. Lanzmann Juniper and E.ON, the mother company, they are also engaged in distribution and you've talked about the customers that you wish to support in the hydrogen industry. What is changing in sales for your company? What is the transition looking like with regards to the future and to see the developments of the future? It's a vast change in the final customer business. Now, I'm going to maybe cut this short too much. We don't have people who buy things from We do have customers there. And it's not about having long-term contracts, but we are engaged in a consultation business and we need to think it from the customer's perspective. So uh, so simplicity, electrification, all of that, uh, and sales uh, must be understood th as something that is done in a partnership. So we need to establish partnerships to our customers. We need to help them with implementing this. We need to closely collaborate with our customers. We need to do it together. We need to implement our own know-how. And that's something that we have done in the past. And we can also then sell this internal knowledge to third parties. And that's something that we've done. And we will do that in the future too. And this is a very, very new development. I think we need to put in a whole lot of effort and work. We need to broaden this entire field of uh, providing consultation services to our customers. And I think that this will be uh, a significant change also here in this area to us as a company. We've talked about uh, competition and change. Ms. Surrey, you've said as to why RWA e is a great energy provider along the value creation chain. Now, the traditional uh, uh, utility provider, do they have an advantage when it comes to hydrogen? And if so, why? Uh, a competitive edge over others. Well, I'd like to phrase it as follows. As a utility provider, it is at the core of our DNA to deal with energy topics of different shapes and sizes. So it's about understanding the production, but only on the one hand side. It's on secondly also about uh, monitorizing it uh, to a customer. And so therefore the customer would like to have a base load capacity of hydrogen 24 seven. So today, if the electrolysis, if it's only going to work, if the wind is blowing, then we don't have that right now. So these topics must be settled and such processes must be steered and we are used to this. We can do it. It's our business and so therefore we need to structure these things, the green APAs. So therefore, from my perspective, we've talked a lot about green power. As a utility provider, we invested heavily in renewables and we are broadening it in the future and so therefore it is a competitive edge because I can think about the entire value creation chain. So I think other companies can do the same, but I think that we have a different approach of thinking about the entire market. Mr. Bratke, in your presentation, you've talked about how the future may look like with regards to the production of hydrogen. Now we've heard about commercialization and distribution to the customer. Now let's talk about economic feasibility. We There's a massive implosion of prices for solar and wind. What is the price development or economic development when it comes to hydrogen? The price of hydrogen is going to be significantly reduced, but it is going to be greater than the price for power uh, generated by wind and PV because we do have energetic losses here and uh, we need to establish additional infrastructure. So electrolyzation, transport capacities, infrastructure also needed to distribute hydrogen to end customers, should this be the case actually in the future. And there is a strong competition between the different industries here that are needing hydrogen desperately and a competitive atmosphere also between different customers. So we need to cover this vast potential also to cover these expenditures with electrolyzations. And here these prices will be reduced similar to what we've seen with PV and wind energy. Now let's take a step back, Ms. Bertler. We talk about competitiveness. Now let's talk about the global level. 
let's talk about the following to which extent can we use the potential of hydrogen in order to actually have a decarbonized world is that something that we as the industrialized can have as a luxury or is it something that is available on the large global scale in the long run i believe that hydrogen is the largest hope that we have so for example in countries like Brazil, in these countries you could theoretically stop cutting down trees because we need the energy that can be created by cutting down these forests. That's absurd. We need to fight highly highly chemistry aspects of agriculture this must also be fought against in Germany there's a vast potential po for PV in agricultural areas it makes more energetic sense uh, to use it in that way for PV than for than for corn uh, because if we use agricultural areas for PV it produces 10 times as much power as a corn plantation. A corn plantation is an ecological uh, insanity but if we were to opt for PV it could be an ecological enrichment. Thank you for this contribution. You've talked about another very important topic and that's acceptance. We talk about corn plantations, PV, electrolyzers, all of these things are not invisible. Because what I'm talking about is all of these things need space and therefore the acceptance fee for large scale plants is decreasing, maybe for solar or for wind. How do, is it possible for us to tackle these problems of acceptancy? The electrolyzer is not the biggest problem. We do know how large a capacity looks for 100 megawatts. To 2,400 square meters is needed and I can put in a second floor and then I have uh, 4,800. So uh, if I do have the respective infrastructure, I need to supply it with the different meters. Also water supply is something I don't see as critical. So we do have the water resources that it needs. All of this water is available. So electrolysis is not the problem. So generating this in the grid and transporting it is the problem and I think we need to increase awareness when it comes to it. Yes, we have developed this uh, fossil energy system. The fossil energy system now with these carbons cannot be broadened any further and in the 21st century we have more intelligent solutions to generate power than to heat up our planet and this awareness must be raised in the people and so therefore I believe that sometimes in the 80s we've lost this awareness for industrial scale power generation. You wanted to add up on that? Yes, I think that with your question you're hitting precisely the point. I think every company is doing it. Surveys about the support for the energy turn and we can see different results in all of Germany. So it is supported by a vast majority of people. Nevertheless, every one of us has uh, gathered experiences with local resistance. And this is across the different parties also, if I may say so. So it's not the case, w uh, as it was with the pandemic, that there is a certain opinion in people who don't trust science. No, it is that the most people support the energy change, but they still would not like to see these things in their close proximity. So therefore it's very important to do PR work. I can talk long about this, 
and also personally I can participate in these municipal boards etc so in the end we don't have to do these investments if you don't wish to see these investments we have other possibilities so but we think that it's important for this and that reason and it's going to be to the benefit of the municipality because there's going to be the law applicable on renewable uh, energies in Germany and so therefore we need to actively engage it in it and it must be a component of the project work also with us with us because without that it doesn't work i do have the hope that this will be subject to change in the coming years but it won't change without any effort on our part and debureaucratization is also something that's going to be important here so we've come up with a simple calculation for a wind project approximately the average uh, project life cycle we have 10 employees working on the project so we also have projects where towards these employees 200 public service officials are working with them that's approving authorities that's for example uh, petition committees for example justices or courts and uh, like in that ratio it doesn't work now i would like to raise the following question in the round is that is this a problem in th of the people in those areas in which we need to uh, build something or is it a problem in polis in politics because they don't tell the people the truth well if i may start i think it's a wrong question to say are the people the problem because all of us are part of society and it's not about attributing guilt because we elect the politicians in their functions and they are mandated to do something and to advance this or that. So in the end, it's a question of educating people. It's a question of engaging in a dialogue at the region that's affected. And if I was to look at the fact that needs to be done by the politics is to establish a long-term framework condition. This long-term orientation is something that establishes trust in society, in the people, and to have such an infrastructure, this investment is not going to be cost-effective after five years or even ten years. And that's something that we've talked about uh, before. So to step away from merely thinking and to get into action, that must be understood by people, that it's important so as to uh, upkeep the wealth in a certain region, to keep people employed. And it's not going to happen if too much is simply avoided. But that's the task of politics, to explain this on the long run, in the long term. Mr. von Weizsäcker, you've just nodded your head. I think it's correct. In any case, it's also correct that it's not over bureaucratized my opinion is well known i think the prices should tell the ecological truth then three quarters of today's regulations could be discarded mr lanzmann from the perspective of a generator i can only repeat many things uh, we support customers, for example, tenants, uh, tenant as an infrastructure operator where integration of citizens or involvement of citizens is an important point in the early phase. It's not a technical issue, it's more an acceptance issue that can, of course, be addressed by involving citizens at a very early stage and that can be mastered in this way. It's important. We saw good examples that worked well. There are also negative examples, as we heard, that uh, some things take 70 months until it happens. That is red tape. But with the colleagues, and uh, we must explain the citizen to the citizens the bridge between energy transition and what we are doing in their backyard. So one thing needs the other. And if this is done, and I think there is broad consensus that this is important, that we have to work on this so that few people say no. So this not in my backyard topic will decrease in importance in that case. I can also say this. I also have this in my backyard and there are many citizens who oppose this even though they say we need energy. So creating acceptance by involving citizens at an early stage and by very good outreach and communication. 
We talked about communication and public relations work. Mr. Bratke, some years ago I saw a TV feature with a very interesting key situation, which I like to tell time and again. It was a project for the development of a hydropower um, pump storage power station and the basin, the upper basin had to be expanded and a citizen initiative was formed against this. They said this is not possible because three trees have to be cut for this and this is not possible. And s then reporters came and interviewed these uh, representatives of the initiative and it said this is very bad and trees are cut and they said okay the alternative would be the company that wants to do this had proposed the upper basin could be covered and put solar panels on top then they said oh then no, this would be devil's work but the birds would be disturbed by the reflections and that would be impossible at all then the proposal was so wind turbines could be built in the forest no birds would hit the wind turbines and then the reporter said at some time a little bit shy and and said, what else do you want then? And this gentleman then said, fully convinced, Germany is the country of engineers and they should develop smart ideas. What else do we have except communication and PR? But what can engineers contribute towards this? My impression is that the citizens have not yet fully understood how big the challenges are. At present, we pay 25 euros per ton of carbon if we refuel our car. The carbon price in industry is in the order of 50 to 60 tons uh, euros per ton. The Federal Environmental Agency calculated last year that the damage that we cause with our carbon emissions are in the order of 180 euros per ton. But this on the condition that the damage will have to be suffered by future generations. The Constitutional Court said that we also have to distribute, equitably distribute the damage that we cause. So those who do the damage must pay for the damage and the Federal Environmental Agency calculated that this would mean that the ton would cost 600 euros and now a recent international study has said if we lo uh, also include the wealth losses, then one ton of carbon that we emit today causes a damage of around 3,000 euros. And if you communicate this to the citizens, if this gets across, then you can talk about differently whether or not uh, three or four trees have to be cut or whether birds would have to suffer from this. So you see the different priorities and ways, weights of the challenges. And we must be brave enough to communicate this. And we all, industry, power plant industry, and the chemical industry, the steel making industry and politicians, we must work together and we must say in 25 years we will have a massive problem unless we start now. And I can imagine that some people may start understanding this and that they will then join us. Now, we talked a lot about how the energy system of the future can look like. And this was always based on one assumption, and this is the, that the electricity and hydrogen consumption would uh, increase. The one topic was not addressed at all, and this is energy efficiency. Where are the potential? Where is the potential there? Mr. Stamatolopoulos, as the head of this association, you have a good overview. How would you assess this situation? How the German energy landscape and the companies handle this? How far have they come? It was already said in some of the presentations, and we also know this in the association, that this is a topic that has been neglected. Energy efficiency has an too small a role to play in energy, in agriculture, and mobility. But nevertheless, even if you assume that given a factor of around 20 to 25, that we increase efficiency by 20 to 25 percent, electricity demand will nevertheless increase. There are several studies on the different climate trajectories until the year 2050 and the numbers differ in Germany with regard to the electricity demand in Germany from 600 to 1000 terawatt hours. But this is the bandwidth. Also considering energy efficiency, we will need more electricity. Mr. von Weizsäcker, what 
do you how do you see this for the globalized world? You said a lot about that mm -hmm. the industrial states already fulfilled this and that now that's now the turn of other countries to achieve a certain certain standard of living. How does the energy efficiency topic fit into this? Who can afford this? Energy efficiency well improving energy efficiency should be lucrative in general but if it is the intention of all the nations of the world to make energy as cheap as possible then it will not materialize the world energy outlook the annual world energy outlook has always has a small chapter how many state subsidies go into the combustion of fossil fuels and this is between 400 billion dollars and 800 billion dollars state subsidies for madness and this is popular uh, just an anecdote on this in 2012 i think it was in 2012 when i looked at the world energy outlook the subsidies had increased by another 200 billion dollars then i asked one of the authors in paris can you explain this madness and he said quite simple this was the arab spring and i said what the hell did this have to do with this if there is a rebellion in the people, then you give them cheap energy. There is politics in it, but the wrong politics. Thank you for this very good statement, as I would say, from the perspective of the energy-intensive industry. Mr. Berkler, what do you do when it comes to energy efficiency, and can you do more? Energy efficiency is a permanent topic for us to get our values down but we are in percentages or percentage range thermodynamics cannot be outsmarted there are certain fundamentals of the equations which i showed they cannot be outsmarted if i um change for a different process then it becomes more effective but if we would change our processes uh, in Austria, then we would need half the energy, uh, the electricity production in uh, Austria, so the others would have to become 50% more efficient. There will be increases in demand, there will be a doubling in electricity demand. And if I say I do the hydrogen myself, energy efficiency is a further development, but it does not solve the topic of availability of this large amount of energy that is required. Energy efficiency is never the less homework we have to do every day in our operations. Every day homework also for utilities or would this destroy your business model? Yeah, I just said it the other way around. Energy efficiency is also for the products that we sell, energy efficiency is part of the products that we sell. There will be a strong increase in electricity demand from the automotive industry, from buildings, despite energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is a very important lever, especially with simple measures, not just for large industrial customers. They already looked at the processes, but medium-sized companies uh, exhaust heat. There are many examples where we are actively working on it, either converted to electricity, then you can feed it into the grid and generate electricity into the grid. So we can then use this waste heat. So these relatively simple measures that we are currently implementing with our customers is an important lever, and this is part, but logically it will not help to reduce the increasing electricity demand but it's an important part that we will definitely have to uh, intensify we just heard mrs zoe energy efficiency does not have the proper rank so far the green electricity um, and green hydrogen you are um, a stakeholder of do you see a regulatory problem or do you see a significance issue that it has not yet been fully understood that is that it has not yet been understood fully that energy efficiency is important it has been understood and i can only connect to what the speakers before me said of course it is logical to 
first of all, to use as little energy as possible. So it's not an either or. We need green electricity, hydrogen and energy efficiency. What can regulation do? Regulation can of course help on the one hand, but market conditions can be enabled for green renewable energies in order to um, um, facilitate this and at the regulatory end we need incentives uh, incentives for energy efficiency that it pays off because first of all you have to invest and the question is what do I do today what do I get back and is it really honored what I'm doing and this must be part of the regulatory framework but away from business case back to science what do scientists have in store when it comes to energy efficiency? Which developments do you see in technical terms? Energy efficiency is extremely important and the World Energy Outlook uh, makes these statements. If we come from the business as usual case to the sustainability path, then one third can be done with renewables, one third with energy efficiency and one third with nuclear and CCS, something in that order. We do not have this. <coughs> we must go much stronger into efficiency and how do we define efficiency? Co coal power plants have efficiency of 45, an old one 33, um, wind turbine has 100%, PV also has 100%, a good diesel engine has 40 to 45% efficiency, an electric motor has 95 minus battery losses, then we arrive at 80%, so with the energy consumption we get significantly down. Heat pump gets three to four parts from the ambient heat, so it reduces, if I compare this to uh, gas or oil heating, it also reduces strongly. All these are potentials which come from technical progress. Then we have technologies, for example, LED lamps, which need only half the electricity compared to fluorescent lamp. We can insulate buildings. Modern buildings do not need any heating energy. The problem is then old buildings, existing buildings, and steelworks in industry, they cannot increase efficiency any further. But the many medium-sized and not energy-intensive companies have enormous potential. So the energy cost share of the German industry, on average, of all the industry is in the order of 2% 2 of total energy. Production costs is energy costs. If we take steelworks out, then it is less than 1% energy costs. So the engine says, for example, uh, should I really work on this all my time in order to get out 1% and <coughs> and all these are the transaction costs. So the learning and decision costs that prevent measures from being implemented. We have 30 networks that we set up for 300 companies and we supported them towards energy efficiency and their progress can be measured from 1% to 2 to 3%. They can increase their share to up to 3% and over a longer period of time this is a lot. And the capital that was invested in order to implement these energy efficiency measures <coughs> had an interest on this. 30% uh, interest if you take the transaction costs out, so consultancy costs and networks where companies work together and learn together how energy efficiency can be increased. This is enormous potential in it. And for German industry, this is also very exciting. They can reduce energy cost dependence on energy imports, but uh, mechanical in engineering industries also benefit from these technologies being manufactured in Germany and not in Asia. So these are win-win effects. Therefore, energy efficiency doesn't mean that we need less electricity. The opposite is true. We need more electricity. So it's correct what was said here. The entire fossil element must be eliminated. We should not uh, um, burn fuel any oil in industry, in uh, transport, and this, we need electricity for this, and this must come from renewable. And if a building is not insulated, doesn't make sense to use heat pumps. We must first insulate buildings, and then we can use heat pumps, and then we can manage change. Thank you for these clear interdependencies that you've shown to us. You've talked about different technologies, and with regards to it, I'd like to talk about hydrogen. 
Initially, we've heard about the different colors when it comes to hydrogen. Blue, turquoise, green. For nuclear hydrogen, I've heard three different colors. White, yellow, and red. In Brussels, it's yellow. Here, it's red. So I'd like to talk about this in greater detail. Is carbon-free the most important thing when it comes to hydrogen? Then red and yellow would be also included, or is the only thing that makes sense uh, the green hydrogen, and to establish that, and we've heard uh, turquoise or blue hydrogen, that this is a transition. How long is this transition going to be for hydrogen? What is RWE betting on, and what do you think it makes sense? As RWE, we are on the long run thinking about green hydrogen. It's the only sustainable color variant or type of this wonderful molecule, and you've also said that this is about ramping up. So therefore, we have to see how this plays out. So hydrogen v volumes are not sufficient in order to have this transition that we've just heard about to ThyssenKrupp and all the other big steel companies. So we need to use other colors as well when it comes to hydrogen. And I think dogmatic approaches are not helpful when it comes to that. So when thinking about the other colors, in Germany, the red, white, and yellow hydrogen does not have a future. That's simple set. That's a political decision. These are the framework conditions in which we simply move. Other countries, however, will use it, uh, probably. So there is a competitiveness here. Again, how we in Germany establish uh, d uh, leadership in technology and various projects in which these uh, asked hydrogen uh, are generated. So this is not necessarily politically supported. It's admitted but not uh, funded. So we see in other countries that this is not the case. In the Netherlands and in Great Britain, it is also connected to their geographical region, the availability of storage facilities, CCS processes. So also in the North Sea, there's a possibility to store it. So, of course, other topics. But also here we can uh, look over and beyond these borders if they wish to produce green hydrogen, then it makes sense. And we can, of course, s uh, have other carbon-saving uh, industries. And then we can think about it and admit it in other countries. And then also we can assume a leadership in this transitional period of the industry. Mr. Landsmann, what is Unipa betting on? Which color are you uh, play for the company color, of course, but also for hydrogen? We are colorblind, I'd like to say. I'd like to say in the long run green hydrogen that is the most sustainable hydrogen no question about it but there are no not sufficient green electrons and we've heard the numbers it is a huge target that we cannot achieve so looking at it f uh, with the numbers so with these long uh, approval periods we cannot do it. In the long run, yes, green, but on in the other periods uh, leading up to the long run, we need to look at this, electrolyzers, pyrolyzers, so splitting of gas. We are taking a closer look at that. We do have an incredible engineering knowledge and we've uh, a vast knowledge uh, when it comes to that and we are more color blind than RWE. Uh, uh, RWE and so in the long run we will also have green but on the short period of time uh, maybe in the medium sh period of time we will also need the other colors if we don't do it with those other colors then we cannot bridge the gap towards the long run uh, of course in the end the uh, end target is clear green but so there is also these framework conditions that you've talked about yes this is a political decision and that's something that is established but the l in the long run, the future is green. Do you not care what c color the molecule has, or do you think that red and yellow is not desired in Germany? It's a typical German way, right? So today we work with black carbon. So 5 million tons of steel in Austria and 30 million uh, in Germany are produced with black carbon. So therefore, a part of this is uh, transitioned towards a grey hydrogen. That's in a first step. Uh, carbon is reduced in a potential, so it can uh, be uh, further reduced by recycling. And w 
so therefore uh, with CCUs maybe 60% are available so here then I need either blue hydrogen meaning that carbon needs to be used when I produce hydrogen but as a matter of principle we shouldn't take the second step before the first step we need to uh, look at the natural gas that we need to use nowadays to uh, use also uh, hydrogen as of 2035 2040 when these framework conditions are established then I can make a smooth transition towards green hydrogen that's a nice calculation I'd like to ask our colleagues in the back of the hall to tune down their talks because if they don't do it I think it's pretty hard for our audience to follow the discussion I know all of you would like to enjoy uh, some cake and a cup of coffee we'll be shortly ready also to come and join you now I will be talking about the colors of hydrogen Mr. Stomatolopoulos if you look at VGBE what kind of chances do you think uh, the member companies standing and also the countries in which they are red and yellow hydrogen what chances to that does that have let me talk also about blue or turquoise hydrogen I'd like to start as follows we need to internalize that we are not alone in the world the other countries they won't sit back and see how we try to generate green hydrogen in Germany and Europe there are some countries they are living from selling raw materials and I expect of these countries that they do react within the climate crisis so that that th they look at decarbonization also and hydrogen will be a commodity and then that means that it will be sold regardless of the fact whether or not it's blue or carbon free or turquoise and carbon free sea or green and coming from North Africa so I think that this development is something that we will see not everything will be depending on our own protection here in Europe or Central Europe the question was with regards to yellow hydrogen nuclear based uh, I believe I would like to agree with you to 100 percent this discussion must not be held in Germany but in other countries it is a topic like France for example I do believe that this is something that will be a thing of the future with regards to it I think it's important and I've heard that in the last presentation that the polit politics takes a decision in regards to the path of acceptance here that this hydrogen is actually accepted I think that this discussion must be put into the context of the discussion that we've seen here in Germany namely how to allow for a smooth transition of 80 gigawatts of con conventional uh, power to uh, this is the peak uh, power that we need to cover how do we allow for a jump towards using green renewables energies and what's going to happen in between what is it that we admit and what is it that we don't admit thank you in the end of our discussion I'd like to follow up on a global and political component everything that we've talked about today in the end serves one great purpose namely climate protection against the heating up of the earth now we can see in the different uh, settings that companies uh, that countries establish targets there's a competition of annual numbers he will be carbon free by 2030 by 2040 uh, climate neutral etc so with all these numbers I'm always asking myself how is all of this going to be f fitting together globally does it make sense that countries formulate their own climate targets their own carbon reduction targets doesn't it make more sense for all for us to sit together and to come up with a general plan Mr. Blatke what is your take on that from uh, the scientific perspective every target helps or is it best to coordinate so we have climate protection agreements for a number of years now and we've seen only very minimal steps 
forward and every country has to s say what are its contributions to this and it sets an example for other countries as well Germany contributes 2% to global c carbon emissions so we don't need to do anything because what are those 2% actually doing but Europe in its entirety is already uh, looking at 10% and we uh, in Europe can establish the technologies, we have the money, we have the know-how, we have the knowledge and the skill set and if we don't do it and show it to others then we can expect the other countries who are going to pick up in pace, who are still uh, going to develop these developing countries. So. You know, now we cannot sit back and say, well, they now have to admit CO2, it's not going to be us anymore. We still have to take the lead in this. And in the highly industrialized company like Germany, it may happen that we take this uh, so-called green power and still to be an industrialized con country and uh, people can accept it and uh, business is going on. So. So power in other countries is generated uh, by nuclear power plants or coal-fired power plants. So uh, maybe if we don't do the PV, then we do also some aspects of it. So for example, the converters or other components of PV facilities, maybe they can be provided by us. So these wind turbine uh, plants uh, with six to eight um, a megawatt. Uh, in order to install them, you need to have the know-how, and this know-how is not available in other countries. And if we uh, are successful in communicating these targets, and uh, if we are successful in helping other countries with implementing these things, then it is about achieving these targets. And now I will be talking about the implementation of it. If we don't achieve in the next four years to actually implement more of these things then we can fill more and more sandbags we've seen the major floods in germany and europe we've seen the major forest fires throughout the world and we can see that these changes are going to be ever swifter so the jet stream m may also change uh, and we will have longer stationary weather because the bad weather used to be with us for a day or maybe two, but now it's going to be for a longer period of time, maybe a week or one and a half weeks of rain. And we've seen that in the Ahrtal region in Germany with the major floods. And also we've seen that with the burning forests, that we need to come towards the implementation. So why is it worthwhile for RWE to become climate neutral by 2040. Why is it worth while and worth the money? Because it's the only way how to survive. Our portfolio can be advanced in order to achieve that. Renewables must be broadened. So technologically, we need to be leading I I globally. And also, we need to arrange ourselves with all these different ver uh, technologies, batteries, uh, hydrogen, etc. And it's worthwhile because it is a followed through aspect of this transition. And we are supported and we are supporting others to do this. And this is a strategy that we don't only see at RWE, but also the other utility providers so have the same. But Mr. Bartke, in order to touch uh, upon what you've said, I would like to support that an international climate protection alliance would be helpful. The larger players would be uh, important like China and India, also the United States. These heavyweights must be included in these efforts. We are a company that's not only engaging in Germany, we are heavily invested in the US and on also on an offshore wind energy. And so therefore we can play a role there and we can learn from Germany. We can learn on which paths Germany treaded in the past and which paths are worthwhile and we can see that this is part of our responsibility we can and will assume in the future we need to talk about specific projects and we need to implement them climate uh, protection and climate neutrality what is your take on that good question To the climate, it doesn't matter where carbon is emitted. So, Mr. Minzinger is completely right. We do bear some responsibility here also from the history uh, in order to take the lead here. And I strongly believe in energy as an export hit. So, that is something as engineers which we can uh, propagate. 
and which we can do in the future. So a, I do have a global perspective on that. I do have some doubts, however. The larger it's going to be, the more difficult it's going to be. And you've said that there's going to be a uh, competition between the different numbers, 60, 70 or even 80 percent. So we, for us, said uh, by 2035 we will be climate neutral. We've also defined intermediate steps. And I, I can say I can run a mar marathon in four hours, but I need to know as I do it, where am I currently standing at? So these milestones I was talking about. So this is my personal worry that we need to have these steps. These milestones, however, for the next years, are not clear. This is what worries me. The end target is clear, however. We wish to be in the lead. We wish to accompany, wish to accompany this and help and assist. And if we do that, we can do it to the benefit and profit of all of us. So uh, this is a topic that we have. Uh, we must tackle this problem. And for the next upcoming generation, I would like to leave a planet that can be lived in. You've said that we carry a responsibility for the carbon emissions in Austria. What is your take on climate protection? Climate protection is in our DNA. So carbon reduction, uh, SO2, or so nitrogen and others were also things that we emitted. I think that these international conferences actually do yield a result. I think that this is important also for the other countries to participate and collaborate. The European Union is at the forefront of this, that's clear. So in the end, we need somebody who buys our products. That's the most important thing. In the end, we need to finance our salaries. So those working with a car manufacturer are paid by the customers buying cars. So PEVs are in demand, so the boom is increasing so in the future we will see how green steel is manufactured and generated and done so therefore the end target is clear we need to go in a step-by-step -step fashion in order to achieve the grand scheme of things so the train is leaving a main train station and and we still need to pick up in speed with so the train needs to be quicker we've already left the station but now we need to pick up in speed and i think uh, Professor von Weizsäcker, maybe you would be best suitable to talk about this aspect. My pleasure, Mr. von Weizsäcker. I'd like to cut it short. The topic that I believe is very important for the international climate discussion is the following, a climate-friendly form of competitive law. I do not see that anywhere in the climate discussion to this very point. That's a catastrophe because it does have a consequence, namely that each company is going to orientate itself I I on the existing competition law and it is almost, almost always harmful to the environment. Mr. Stamonopoulos, uh, would you like to react to that and as an association is it possible to f fight for this? Well, I would like to answer your two questions. First off, the presentation shown by Professor von Weizsäcker that we are located in the Blue Europe is something I like. We assume the responsibility for the entire globe and I think that this is justified for it to happen. And for Germany, I think it's a pretty big bet. The project of the energy turn, as we coined it, whether or not we maintain to be uh, an industrialized nation, nation and nevertheless to have a neutral carbon footprint, that's the question. Whether we as v VGBE fight for a new world trade regulation, that's difficult because I think we are subscribed to technology. Our knowledge, our skill set can be provided to others. We happily do so. We can explain why something works, why something doesn't, and what's the most optimal way to forward. Uh, but that's uh, for politics to decide. We can help and assist in that endeavor. Thank you, dear guests. I think that the time was flying by so fast. I can't believe that we've already come to the end of our afternoon discussion and therefore also arrived at the end of today's day. I think that we've learned quite a lot. It was full of energy, full of information, and 
I would like to thank all of my panelists here for the vivid discussion. Thank you for taking your time to be here with us and presenting and discussing these topics.